Hello friends and welcome to week two, lecture two, where we continue and actually complete our survey of key terms, key concepts in the study of comparative politics. Um, let's keep in mind that one of the large terms we're discussing and we need to come to terms with is the idea of the state, of the state. The state is a geographic reality. We're talking about realism. The state is, the, is a uh, political reality. It is an entity. It actually exists. It typically has specific borders uh, that within those borders it is sovereign. Sovereignty is a key word. Sovereignty means where ultimate power resides. Again, sovereignty means where ultimate power resides. And so sovereignty is a very important concept in the study of politics, although these have become increasingly complex and hard to figure out in the 21st century. Uh, sovereignty is the highest authority a state, and we think of state as government uh, as, as well, but state meaning state is a more precise terms. Uh, uh, states make up the international system. We have about 200 uh, states according to the United Nations. I think I used a figure of 190 uh, in my lecture notes, but that's because this concept is constantly changing. The history of political science has been one where states were not as developed from early times, uh, ancient times, until really the modern era. States were very, very small and one could over a few days typically walk a whole uh, state and so you had uh, before uh, the Roman Empire and before uh, other large uh, empires arose uh, states were very small in fact if you look at the great studies of politics uh, uh, Plato's Republic or Aristotle's book called the politics they talk about the state as polis, P-O-L-I-S, which is a Greek word meaning city-state. They thought the average size, the best size of the city-state was about 5,000. If it got bigger than that, it was not operational. Uh, it couldn't serve its functions. It couldn't do uh, the work of uh, a state or a government. This changes in the modern uh, world in about the 17th century uh, when the theories of the state, especially uh, the theorist Baudin, uh, the Frenchman, uh, came up with the idea that sovereignty resides in the group of people who form the state and the Treaty of, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, uh, which followed the horribly destructive Thirty Years' War, which is one of the most destructive wars uh, with the religious basis. Uh, and all of the modern era came up with this idea of assigning borders, uh, giving those within those borders sovereignty. So they have the creation of the modern state. Before that point, it was power was shared, particularly in Western Europe, uh, really between the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, and particular uh, political leaders, but basically the, the uh, Catholic Church and the concept of state sovereignty comes into being and becomes central to the study of politics, central to the study of a lot of, 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 of human life. Um, the doctrine of state sovereignty says that a state has supreme authority within its geographical limits or borders. And this sets up the whole modern state system. So what we think of today is uh, an international system of, of 200 countries uh, could not have been understood in the ancient world or even um, uh, outside of Rome and the Roman experience and a few other examples. So it's a very new idea when we talk about state sovereignty. So we deal with the international community today of, of, of many, many countries, 200 countries. Some of those uh, that are recognized by the United Nations are not powerhouses. For example, the, the Vatican is considered a state. That's the, that's the uh, physical location of uh, the operations of the Catholic Church uh, that are within the city of Rome uh, in Italy. Uh, also so have, have very small, almost micro-states and other smaller states uh, that um, uh, one, can, one can quibble about whether they're actually states or not, but we have a but 
since the Treaty of Westphalia, we have the creation of the modern state system. And that's how uh, we think of comparative politics and think of world politics. Second concept is regime. And that's the set of rules under which a particular state operates. And there's really two components of that. One is called de jure, the, a de jure constitution. That's a constitution that's in black and white. It's written down. It's the guide for citizens of the state and how they live. The other is a de facto. Uh, that's one of tradition. That's the one of the way things were done in the past. Largely an unwritten constitution. Now we tend to think that the de jure constitution being written is more important, but that's certainly not true. Uh, the de facto constitution is uh, also very important in the life of any country and any state. And when we study it in a comparative sense, that uh, de jure constitution may be more important in some states and others, as well as the de facto constitution being more important in some states than the other. A third concept is the concept of government. And that's the people who are the political leadership who are running the country. So you've got state, which is a geographical entity. We have, on the other hand, the regime, the set of rules, the constitution uh, that uh, set the parameters for politics in that country, and then the government. The government are the people who run the government, okay, uh, who control the state. Um, in the United States, we have, uh, we elect a president every four years, we elect our executive, we elect uh, a legislature, House every two years, Senate every, every six years, and then we have a, uh, an appointed but yet approved judiciary. So our system is pretty straightforward. In some countries this is somewhat less clear. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind is that government, the regimes within a government change over time. Uh, for example, the United States is very different. We have a different regime in many ways after the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, where power is given to the federal government that it was not before. Before, the states were seen largely as the center of power. Um, sometimes the possibility uh, happens that the state changes. Uh, it becomes different. In, in those cases, almost always the regime changes. Some, some examples, um, about a decade ago, there was a peaceful, initially peaceful separation in uh, West Africa of North Sudan and South Sudan. Sudan had been one country at civil war, so divide the country up uh, and uh, we still have a great deal of turmoil there, but that's there's two new two new governments are created, two new regimes. Another great example is in the former Yugoslavia, where I um, uh, had an opportunity to visit under the auspices of the United States Army. Uh, Yugoslavia was a group of countries, a group of, of, of really regional uh, attachments, uh, communities that were brought together in. Under, after World War II, under the control of a strong man by the name of Marshal Tito. Um, when Tito died in 1980, uh, those pieces fell apart, and they're now all independent states with independent uh, regimes. Uh, so uh, the governments and regimes can change, usually they change together. Um, next concept, the idea of nation. A nation is a large group whose members belong together on a basis of a shared identity. States are objective when nations are subjective. We don't always know who the parts of a nation are, but it is based on the collectivity of individuals. Well, what's that co collectivity based upon? One idea is ethnicity. What uh, eth ethnic group uh, dominates an area? This is a type of group identity. Um, and so many times that group identity becomes the basis of the state and the regime. Also some kind of civic attachment, some kind of great idea about how politics, about life, uh, can be the basis of a nation. In America we talk about the land of the free, um, the, uh, the language of the, De the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, 
as being kind of a civic umbrella under which all Americans live and aspire. So we have the, so some people, some states are, some nations are brought together by the sense of ethnicity. Others are brought together by a sense of sort of civic awareness. Um, others are brought together by the notion of nationhood, uh, shared patterns of doing things, uh, people that take, uh, share a lot of habits over a long period of time. And um, so they can, they can reconcile other differences to form a nation that in a sense becomes a state and a government. So um, another quality that shapes the notion of nation is that of nationalism, the attachment to a country, uh, come Hades or high water. The idea of nationalism is that my country, right or wrong, uh, very different from the concept of patriotism, which suggests that you should be willing or capable to challenge your government if you need to. Um, uh, the nation state is the idea that the nation and the state, both of which we've talked about already, are really one. In reality, uh, this is not always the case. Um, but in most countries, there is a dominant national group and various minority groups. Uh, so this idea of the nation state is uh, where the, the nation and the state come together. So that large ethnic group or that coalition of smaller ethnic groups in cahoots with the larger ethnic group form the country. Um, so uh, sometimes there, there is, when they share a common purpose, purpose or the civic understanding, they can reconcile tremendous differences. One of those differences would be, uh, uh, or, or it could be, it could be one, or it could be a variety of, of different interests. A classic study of this is Switzerland, which is made up of 25 cantons. They don't even all speak the same language. They speak either, um, they speak either German, or they speak French, and they have different ideas of, of government. One Swiss canton, for example. Uh, gave women the right to vote, I think, in the 19th century. The last Swiss, Swiss canton, the 25 parts, um, gave a women the right to vote in 1971, I believe. So um, the parts are very different, but they have that shared civic purpose. They don't have any ethnic ties. They don't have, uh, in a sense of all sharing, all have a shared ethnic tie, or uh, even the same idea of what it means to be a nation, but they have that civic awareness of what it means to be Swiss. And that means a lot more, by the way, than just eating chocolates. I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, that means a kind of shared purpose of government. Let each go by its own way. That's how they share. Okay, shifting gears, we're going to talk about the classification of political systems. How do we categorize different kinds of systems? We're going to use the idea of typologies. Typology is a fancy word that you can use to win friends and influence people. Uh, and but in typologies is how we break down different types of political systems. Uh, basically, the most famous classification, and to me, uh, the most important for study, is that which was done by the great uh, Greek political philosopher Aristotle. By the way. Aristotle was Plato's student, who I referred to earlier, and so um, uh, the uh, you see some of the, the connections of the great minds of, of this in the study of politics. Um, basically, uh, Aristotle came into three categories: the rule of one, the rule of few, the few, and the rule of the many. And there's a good version and a bad version of each one of those. The rule of one means one person is in charge. Uh, and when that one person, uh, if that one person is a bad dude or dudette, uh, who only enriches themselves, doesn't care about the citizens, doesn't care about the welfare of, of government, doesn't care about the welfare of any group of which they're not a member of in the state, we call that tyranny. That's when people are not, do not have um, the opportunity to influence government, uh, don't have any, any ability to influence the state, and also it means typically they don't have a lot of freedom, uh, very few uh, liberties. The positive version of the rule of one we call monarchy. 
uh, usually the rule of one who looks after the welfare of the citizenry uh, and tries to protect the regime. Okay, Aristotle's second category, the rule of the few. Sometimes that can be the rule of a few who, again, like tyranny, only care about themselves, their own interests, they don't care about the welfare of the, of the um, state uh, or the nation, and we call that particular arrangement oligarchy. On the other hand, when you have a small group, the rule of a few, who look after the welfare of the regime, look after the welfare of citizens, we call that aristocracy. This leads us to Aristotle's next classification, the rule of many. When there, Aristotle said that when there were uh, large groups in charge and uh, everyone was involved, we call that democracy. Democratus, rule by the people. Again, democracy, demos, meaning people in Greek, kratos, meaning rule, rule by the people. And that's, that's almost like a um, religion to us and are of religious significance to those of us in America in the 21st century. You can't say anything bad about democracy because democracies like mom, apple pie, uh, and insert your favorite vehicle, Ford, Chevrolet, uh, Hyundai, whatever it is, uh, you can't criticize it because it's, it's above criticism. Well, in reality, democracy is not. Democracy can be uh, chaotic, it can be destructive, it can undermine the nation state at some point if not uh, if not restrained in some way. Uh, that's why we elect people to uh, office for periods of time, that's why we have all kinds of restrictions. Uh, Plato in his great work The Republic for example referred to democracy as just being unfocused and without any kind of principle. One day it's, it's uh, physical exercise, one day it's wine, one day it's um, um, time with one of, with a, a lover of some sort, uh, fun and frolicking. Uh, so it's just completely undisciplined life, and that's the problem of democracy. Uh, and that's for your evaluation and for you to consider. Now following that rule of the many, Plato has a, uh, Aristotle, excuse me, has a more positive model that he calls polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y which means a balance, that you divide power into an executive and into a legislative type functional rule of people and then you have judges as well. Um, my lecture notes have a number of other kinds of classifications that I ask you to look at uh, as well. Which leads us really to our next topic is the classification of, uh, of authority, not just the kind of regimes but uh, authority and uh, we call those um, the, a unitary system, which means all power is in one place. We can have a federal system where the power is shared. Or we can also have a confederal system where each part has authority for its part, but they may agree with a um, larger collective nation-state on a number of issues. Most commonly that it's placed in terms of national security where they agree that in times of crises they come together and support each other. A good example of this type of arrangement in the founding of America is in the Articles of Confederation where they pledge their sacred honor to use the language of the, of the uh, Articles of Confederation that uh, they were in this thing called America together. And, but each part, according to Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation, each part, each state in the American sense, was sovereign. Also, today in the 21st century, we're part of many treaties that connect us in a confederal way internationally. For example, in the NATO treaty, each country who signs that treaty promises to protect each other country. For example, Turkey is a long way from the United States. If Turkey is invaded by the NATO treaty, we are pledged to support Turkey, even go to war to support Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, these are some uh, initial kind of surveys of key terms and concepts that we'll be coming back to throughout this course. Uh, the lecture notes and the textbook offer additional insight. Uh, my purpose in the lectures is to give you a quick survey that you can think about 
and as and for some of you who have studied this before, just a little bit of a refresher. Uh, thank you very much.